I will start with a question and the answer to which is very much there in front of you but what is communication? So communication is a dynamic process. It is the conveying of thoughts and feelings. It depends upon the course of events, the stimuli that you are exposed to. And it is the way you speak, the way you use your body language, the way you interact with the people, the way uh, you express your ideas, emotions, your gestures, your postures. Everything comes within communication. So word communication is derived from Latin word communis, which means to share or to participate. So when you are sharing something, or participating in some activity, so that is communis or communication. It is also called a two-way process of reaching mutual understanding in which parties involved exchange information, news, ideas and feelings. So this is very uh, generic definition about uh, communication. So if uh, you uh, go to the broader sense, Communication is not about, not only about sharing of ideas, emotions, feelings, gestures, postures, exchanging of information, mutual understanding. Uh, the, the communication is uh, a slightly bigger subject. Like in very simple words, when we talk about the word telecommunication, so in uh, even in that thing communication is involved. So communication uh, simply means uh, transferring something from point A to point B. Like you put something from your sofa and uh, drop it on your table, this is communication. You uh, exit from your house and uh, you enter a shop, that is communication. So whatever is happening, wherever there is a movement, there is communication. Now this is uh, the process of communication and in this we see the source, encoding, channel, decoding and receiver. So when we talk about source, source is the one who initiates a message in verbal or written form. He initiates a message at talk, he writes a message or he uh, writes uh, something that is uh, the beginning of communication. So the source first of all needs to decide what to say, what to write. Now, say, this is very important question that we should know that what our requirement is. What do we need to write? Or what do we need to say? We can say plenty of things, but uh, we should plan and then speak. So we should always think before we are speaking something. So whatever we are speaking is worthless or not, uh, the thing that I am going to communicate, is it authentic or not? Or the thing that I want to say to the people, is it true? Is it of uh, some benefit? Uh, or is it for larger good purposes? So then the source should issue or initiate the message. And then the message is encoded. So encoded uh, is uh, like a form of making codes of the sound signal. That can be in various types. For example, when you talk about uh, the transmission on radio or television, so our sound is transmitted into electric signals. So that is encoding of it. So that encoding through some channel is, is sent to the speakers and then they're again decoded and we listen to the voice. So this is encoding. Now encoding a process in which we give a formal way, a formal uh, dress to the language. For example, that can be uh, Urdu language, that can be English language. So we are giving some shape to the language. Now I have some thought. I have some thought that I want to write. I have some thought that I want to say. No, writing and saying that in some particular language is encoding of it. Like I am encoding that in Urdu, I am encoding that in English and then I am transmitting it. And then there is a channel. The channel is, uh, channel can be verbal channel or that can be written channel. 
so in verbal channel we have one to one communication like which is called face to face communication telephonic con uh, communication so these are verbal channels in written channels we have uh, text messages we have email we have uh, letters so that is a written channel and then communication then whatever is said and whatever that passes through a channel is decoded so when we are decoding the message we if we know english we are we can easily decode the message of english if we know urdu we can decode the message that is sent in urdu and there is always a receiver so he is basically the one who decodes the message so once he is done with the decoding uh, he will give a feedback to the source and now that feedback will ultimately mean whether communication is successful or not for example the source had sent a message and the message was in verbal form and uh, the, the receiver heard the message and then he replied to it correctly so this means the communication process was successful and this was an effective communication so if you uh, go into your past like this was a common game in the childhood that we would practice uh, or experience such communication style that we held two jars and uh, or two tins uh, along with a wire that was attached to both of them and from one end one would speak and from the other end uh, the receiver would listen so from there we have this uh, communication process uh, and so i'm explaining from that point of view so you can see the sender so the sender here is uh, holding uh, the tin in his hand and uh, he is basically the speaker he is the sender and whatever he is saying that thing is encoded if he is saying in urdu so that message is being recorded in urdu or he is saying that in urdu if he is speaking in english so that is the encoding of the message in english so uh, both the tins and the wire it is the communication channel through which the voice is transmitted the message goes through the wire so it is inside somewhere and then when it reaches the receiver he decodes the message for example if he knows urdu so he and the message is in urdu so he is decoding it because you know he knows uh, the codes of urdu language he knows how to break them now the process of communication and uh, in this process of communication the source is of greater importance now the source determines what uh, why to communicate what to communicate uh, the usefulness of communication and accuracy of the information to be communicated now that depends about the source that depends upon the source uh, like uh, what kind of person he is like for example you must have heard that if someone is uh, telling some hadith or some uh, quranic verse we do ask the source of it or especially in the case of hadith we do ask the source of it because uh, there are so many uh, people who are uh, narrating hadith and uh, we need to uh, sure, make sure whether it uh, really exists or not uh so the and in your daily life you must have seen that uh, uh, if you come to know that person who is always cheating who is always lying who is always uh, deceiving others uh, you will not tend to believe in what he says you will be uh, like you will be saying that that person is always liar so we cannot uh, trust the things said by such person so the source is of greater importance Uh, this, uh, the authenticity of the source, uh, the truthfulness of the source, that matters a lot. So, uh, in in communication, uh, the the role of the source is very important because uh, a good for good communication, uh, the source should determine uh, why is he communicating and uh, what is the content that he should communicate. Like we can speak aimlessly. but he should first determine that what for a good communication rather that uh, what he can speak or what what should be the content what should be the knowledge that he should deliver like we prepare our lecture before we go to the classroom uh, 
and then usefulness of communication he should keep in mind that why is that communication going on is this useless talk or that will aim or that will achieve something in the end so this is uh, one of the key factors that he should note then accuracy of the information the source should uh, make sure that whatever information is uh, he is sharing is is factual is authentic and is accurate uh, because rumors spread like this way because we are not uh, uh, certain of uh, their authentic uh, uh, they were the authentic or not and we are sharing them uh, in uh, with so many people and then that uh, multiplies and prevails and then uh, in fact in uh, the thing is not true that is not based upon truth so we should be very much careful about the accuracy of the information that we intend conveying nowadays we see that uh, uh, on our whatsapps uh, on facebook social uh, using the, the social media uh, a bulk of fake news and information is shared and they are shared because uh, people want their publicity people want uh, the maximum views on their channels on their uh, uh, on the social pages so they don't mind making fake or false news so this is ethically and uh, uh, like uh, your uh, in in your social ways in your uh, uh, day to day life well, morally it is a bad thing then encoding encoding is a process encoding is a process for example if uh, uh, i need to speak uh, uh, to my english friend i'll be using the codes of english language if i need to talk to my uh, friend in village i'll be talking to him in punjabi codes so i need i need to give address to my language and encoding is that address that what kind of uh, codes i am put a, giving to the words that i want to convey or to my thoughts basically so the process of transferring the information you want to communicate into a form that can be sent and correctly decoded at the other end so this is a process of transferring the information that you want to communicate into a form that can be sent and correctly decoded at the other end i can record my communication the way i am recording i can uh, give the language address uh, i give the thought language uh, address of language i can uh, pen it i can write it so there are so many things the way i can encode my message now in encoding i should be able to know uh, that uh, like uh, how to communicate like this is my ability to convey information and then i should uh eliminate the confusion of uh, uh cultural issues mistaken assumptions missing information so i should be uh making it so clear that there is no issue involved and then knowing your audience if i am recording my message i am encoding my message i should know who are the people i am talking to or referring to if the people that i am talking to are english then i should be recording my message in english or sending my message in english if the people happen to be uh, urdu speakers then my language preferable language should be urdu so this matters so we should know the audience and we should make our content uh, uh, why are we communicating with them what are we communicating with them the usefulness of communication everything should be prepared according to the need and wants of the audience lacks wants and needs of the audience next is channel so we have verbal uh, communication channels and written communication channels so the channels uh, are the medium through which the conversation or the communication is going on so in verbal communication channel we have face to face meetings we have telephone we have video conferencing and in written communication channels we have letters emails memos reports so in verbal communication channel we have face to face meetings like we talk to a person face to face uh, we can look at it, each other's expressions there's no confusion about that 
we can uh, see a person is smiling or not is frowning or not is uh, uh, getting angry or not so then we have telephone and on telephone we can have a good communication again but again since we don't have the face of the person in front of us we are not sure about his facial gestures or emotions but yes uh, from his tone we get an idea video conferencing is another way of communicating uh, with one person with more than one person we can use zoom we can use uh, facetime we can use whatsapp video calls so there are so many mediums nowadays uh, which can help in video conferencing uh, in written communication channels we have letters uh, yes the old ones and uh, the emails which replace the letters and uh, memos and reports so all these things are uh, again conveying the information all these things are communicating the information but these are communicating in a written way so the uh, verbal and written communication both have their strengths and weaknesses now as far as uh, verbal communication is concerned the strength of verbal communication is that the role of body language is conspicuous that is very much in front of us we can know uh, how a person is behaving posing or the, how a person is giving gestures or uh, uh, we can convey, our, convey ourselves better through our body language like in every good presentation uh, our body language uh, fills in 75% of the communication and rest of uh, 25% or even less than that is verbal section so more than 75 to 80% is the role of your non verbal communication and body language is one of them so we there is uh, the strength uh, if your body language is working well uh, like it is not present in written communication we cannot see the body language uh, and the non verbal communication in the written scripts uh, uh, like it is a strength of verbal communication the strength of uh, uh, the weakness of uh, verbal communication is that we not it is not possible to give long list of directions for example uh, we cannot remember or learn all the things by heart i cannot uh, uh, like uh, remember longer points by heart so i need to pen them down point by point okay if i am to initiate a meeting with my colleagues and i am presiding the meeting so i will be keeping my notes with them and by looking at one point i'll be explaining the point so this is the way that that is easier for me i don't or uh, not everyone has very good memory that they can remember everything by heart so this is weakness of verbal communication uh, written communication uh, the strength of written communication is that there's always a proof of communication whatever we are talking we are making it documented we are making a proof of it or uh, we are like uh, uh, making it uh, right, uh, written in black and white in front of us so the proof in written communication is not found in uh, the verbal communication we are not all the time recording audio video recording the person so that we can have a proof of what the person said but the written communication uh, especially in official documentation is a proof uh, all the letters are a proof so we uh we need to keep them saved so that we can we need to use them when uh, there is time and then weakness uh, uh, the written words do not show uh how a person's actual feeling so written words uh never show that uh, the feelings of a person the true feelings of a person we cannot understand by looking at the written words the emotions uh text messages and uh, written communication that has uh, that has for very long time uh, creating a confusion among the relations because uh, we could not express our emotions uh, that if i'm writing something bad if then i'm feeling bad as well no there could be vice versa uh, like uh, now we can use emoticons we can use gestures so we can be sure that uh, what is the mood of the person in conveying an information uh but uh, in those days in earlier days we did not have this proof uh, and even the official documentation we still uh, don't know what uh, what is the actual feeling of a person so this is the weakness of it 
Decoding is like to listen actively and reading information or listening to the information carefully in both the channels. I guess spoken channel, hai, so you will listen actively. If written channel, hai, you will read carefully. So you need to avoid question and you need to ask if you have missed something. Agar bhi baat samay nahi aayi, if uh, or you cannot, you could not understand something in written text or verbal uh, speech. So you should ask the question again to remove that confusion. So in that way, your decoding will be successful. Then we have the receiver. So there are certain things about receiver. So the prior knowledge can influence the receiver's understanding. So prior knowledge matters a lot. For example, if you don't know anything about uh, a mobile phone, and I give you a lecture on it, some innermost part, you will you may not be able to understand that because you did not have the prior lecture. Or if I start teaching you uh, the tenses, okay, present indefinite tense ye hota hai, past perfect ye hota hai, without telling you the parts of speech. So since you don't have the prior knowledge of the parts of speech, you may not be able to understand the tenses. So in this way, the present knowledge or the prior knowledge about something that is uh, spoken or written, that is necessary. And then uh, about written communication, you know that if you're, you're reading some novel for the first time, you feel it difficult. But if you already know a story about that novel, so you that is uh, somewhat easier for you that you easily understand it because you have a story idea. And then there are blockades in the receiver's mind. Maybe the receiver is not willing to what you are saying, willing to perceive what you are saying. He is not willing to absorb what you want to convey. There are some blockades. He is not listening. He doesn't want to listen. He is not mentally present. He is not uh, willing to talk. So there are so many barriers which are there in effective communication. Or maybe he's not understanding you. Maybe he's uh, not familiar with the language you have spoken, sp you, the language you are speaking. And then uh, the surrounding disturbance, dis uh, disturbances, these, are, these refer to the noise, the environment where you are sitting, where you are talking. For example, if you are speaking to your uh, brother in Urdu language, but if you are in some stadium, he will not be able to understand you. So this is the surrounding disturbance. Noise disrupts your communication system. Uh, for effective communication, we should choose a place which is not noisy or less noisy. So uh, you must have noticed a library is said to be the quietest or uh, the most silent place in some institute. Why is it silent? Because you are able to concentrate. Now the feedback is important. Now feedback determines whether the communication is successful or not. Now feedback can be your verbal reactions and non-verbal reactions. Feedback can be positive and negative. For example, if I uh, request someone to please uh, fetch me a glass of water, and if that person notes or he goes practically and brings a glass of water uh, without uh, saying anything, so this is non-verbal reaction, but feedback is there. And if I again request a person to fetch me a glass of water and he says, okay, yes, I'm bringing it for you. So this is verbal reaction. So there are verbal and non-verbal reactions in feedback. So if a person goes in both ways and brings me a glass of water, uh, the communication is successful. So then there is positive feedback and negative feedback. We give a feedback to each other. And uh, that feedback sometimes is constructive, sometimes that is critical. So <clears throat> both are aiming at the betterment of something. We always give a feedback because we want improvement in something. So feedback is only given when you have understood a thing, whether it comes to your standard or not, whether you are uh, impressed or not. In both the ways, uh, we need to give feedback. The students are writing in their examination on the papers. We check them and then the score or the comments we write on that, them are, are of feedback. So if uh, the feedback is there, that makes a certain that communication was successful. Next, we have types of communication. And uh, the types of communication is different according to certain different classifications. So first of all, it is according to the number of people who receive the message. 
So according to this, we have interpersonal communication, intrapersonal communication, group communication, and mass communication. So uh, interpersonal communication is when uh, we are talking to someone, to some people, to one uh, more than one person, when we are having a uh, discussion with them, when we are having some interaction with them. So in this way, that is interpersonal communication. That is beyond your personal level. So you're talking to either one or more than one person. So you can, we daily uh, uh, go through this process. We talk to people in our house, in our professional life, in day-to-day -day markets, in uh, our way back home. So whatever we are doing, we are meeting people. Man is social animal. So man needs society to live with. So if we are talking about interpersonal communication, then uh, there are so many people who are having certain different images of us. So we are not what we feel what we are. So we are what others see us as, what, we, uh, what they feel us to be. So our image about uh, uh, our, our image in the eyes and mind of the other people that matters a lot. I may be considering myself uh, the best person, but I don't know that my next door neighbor uh, what does he think about me. So our interpersonal communication should be good. So the words are uh, your expression, the expression of your character. They tell what you are. So once a person came to Socrates, the great Greek philosopher, and uh, he was uh, uh, having a towering personality, he was uh, in a very good dress, he seemed rich. So when he uh, met Socrates, and Socrates asked him to communicate, to talk. So he asked him to talk so that uh, Socrates can observe uh, what kind of person he is. So you are... Uh, your personality, your uh, being rich or poor, or uh, your uh, dress sense, that doesn't make what you really are. That is your communication. So your communication makes it what you need to be or what you really are. Then we have interpersonal communication. Now, interpersonal communication is a person's own communication with, own, with his own self. The way a person talks to his own self. Uh, as a man, manner of monologue, as a manner of soliloquy, that a p person is talking to his own self or he is giving address to his thoughts. So uh, we see the examples of intrapersonal communication in dramas when an actor is talking to himself so that the audience knows what is what does he feel or what is he feeling right now. And uh, our intrapersonal communication is basically uh, a way towards the interpersonal communication. If our loneliness is better, our gathering will be the best. So if our loneliness is uh, full of sense, so the, our gathering must be like this. So uh, uh, the birds of feather flock together. So a man, again, is known by the company he keeps. So our intrapersonal communication, our thoughts, our uh, whatever we are thinking the whole day, that matters a lot and that weaves a way to uh, our interpersonal communication. Then we have group communication. We have so many people gathered and we are talking to them like uh, in classroom lectures, like in academies, like uh, in, of in official meetings. So we have larger group. So uh, when we are talking to them, this is group communication. Again, for gr group communication, we should be conscious in using uh, proper words. Then we have mass communication. Now the mass communication is what I am doing here. So I am uh, recording this lecture and uh, all the students uh, and all those who have subscribed my channel, they will be listening to this lecture. And uh, uh, this is like, uh, especially at this level, one should be very conscious about the selection of words because your words are communicated and they're not communicated to one person. Even one person is sometimes enough to create rumors about you or about what you said. So uh, you must have heard about Chinese whisper, that you whisper in someone's ear and that thing is uh, transmitted from one to another. And the last person who listens to the whisper is, uh, he comes up with entirely changed uh, sentence or topic. So this shows that 
uh, even one person is enough to convey the false news. So for mass communication, we need to talk uh, sometimes to a huge public and uh, we should be very careful about the selection of words. Then uh, second classification is on the base of medium employed. So when we talk about medium, we have verbal communication and we have non-verbal communication. So verbal communication is when we are using the words uh, or, uh, in oral or written both forms. And non-verbal communication is uh, our body language, our emotions, our expressions, our feelings, our gestures, our postures, uh, our eye movement, and then uh, 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 silence, space, and time. So silence, space, and time are, again, very crucial for the non-verbal communication. The third classification is on the base of organizational structure. So in uh, third classification, we have formal communication and informal communication. So formal communication is the communication in which we are very uh, much careful about the selection of words. Uh, and because uh, we don't want that, uh, uh, like uh, we don't want to include slangs in them. We don't want to include uh, joke in them. So that has to be very uh like a, a didactic kind of communication, the communication that is very serious, uh, serene kind of communication that we are making. Also, that is uh, informal communication. Informal communication is when we are not uh, uh, taking much care about the rules or uh, the standard of language that we are using. So we can sometimes use non-standard language. We can use slangs in them. So that happens between uh, friends or uh, the colleagues who are quite uh, near to each other, uh, who have intimacy with each other. Uh, class fellows have uh, informal communication. We have informal communication with our uh, good friends, cousins, uh, brothers, family. So there is an informal communication. Then on the base of flow direction, uh, this is fourth classification. We have downward communication, upward, horizontal, and diagonal. So downward communication is when a boss is writing a letter and he's transmitting the letters uh, to his subordinates. Uh, that means that comes from uh, high up to uh, the junior ones, from uh, the employer to the employees. Upward communication is when the employees are writing to employer or when a, a subordinate is writing to his boss, writing or speaking both. Uh, horizontal communication is when uh, a colleague is talking to another colleague when uh, like uh, a director is talking to another director within the same company, uh, a clerk is talking to another clerk. In diagonal communication, uh, a clerk of one institute is talking to the clerk of another institute or a principal of one college is writing to the principal of another college. We have six ways of using nonverbal communication. Uh, we have eye contact, we have facial expressions, gestures, posture and body orientation, proximity, paralanguage or paralinguistics, uh, and humor. So uh, eye contact is uh, our direct and most expressive part of our body. Like there are different ways of eye contact. Uh, if you're having direct eye contact that shows that we are confident. If we are looking downwards, it means we are listening carefully or we are guilty. If we, are, if we have single raised eyebrow, that means we are doubting on the stuff that we are listening or reading. Both raised eyebrows, uh, they express our wonder uh, or uh, that we are surprised or we are admiring something. Uh, if you have bent eyebrows, it means we have sudden focus on some saying or some written document, written material. If you have tears coming out, so that is the extreme of emotions that either we are too happy or too hurt. So eye contact matters a lot whenever we are in uh, our class or when we are uh, delivering our presentations in the class. So uh, our confidence is... Uh, uh, like that does our confidence is reflected through our eye contact. 
if a girl is delivering the presentation in a co-class, so if she is looking merely on girls, so she is not confident. Or if a boy is merely looking on the boys, so he is not confident as well. So the eye contact demands that it should be made with every person present so that none of uh, the audience feels that the person is lacking courage to talk to you in eyes. And why we are not having eye contact? Because we are not confident. We may not be confident because of our knowledge, because of our skills, because of our dressing, because of our personality. So there can be so many reasons. So we need to avoid all those reasons so that we can have a better eye contact with the people. Uh, if you're looking downwards and we are uh, being, uh, in that way we are being guilty or we are trying to listen carefully. So if someone is talking to you and you are looking sideways, uh, you're not uh, having an eye contact with the person, you're looking uh, sometimes downwards, sometimes upwards, sometimes right and left. So that makes the person, the speaker believe that you're not interested, you're evading, you're trying to uh, end the discussion and go. If you have single eyebrow, eye, uh, eyebrow raise, so that shows okay, you're doubting something. So there, there could be so many uh, things uh, that we doubt in daily life. Uh, if someone communicates a thing that we are not believing in it. So we have this kind of gesture. So these are the gestures because of uh, the use of eye contact. So eye contact is quite necessary in our communication. Like, in other words, our communication is never successful without eye contact. It is again said when, that when you are a good presenter or you want to be an effective teacher or presenter, uh, don't turn your back to the students. So, at least if you have to write on whiteboard, you should be tilting towards the board, but at least your some dimension should be towards the students so that no one else is uh, breaking the eye contact so when eye contact breaks, uh, the uh, like uh, the, the complete impression, uh, the complete focus is uh, broken. Uh, another example is that uh, whenever you see a theater or a stage, you will never see any actor turning his back upon you. So the, a good actor never turns his back upon the people, upon the audience. So eye contact should be made with everyone and that is quite a necessary part of it. Next is uh, facial expression. So smile covers the most part of facial expression. And it is a powerful cue that transmits your happiness, friendliness, your warmth, liking, affiliation. So if uh, your face is not smiling, you're taken either rigid or proud or uh, like uh, a very serious person so communication with such people becomes difficult so if your face is smiling so it means that you are happy you are friendly you are showing your warmth you are liking the stuff you are being uh, you are showing your affiliation so in this way your smile works and uh, <clears throat> we should smile while looking at each other so even uh, giving a smile to your parents when you're looking at uh, them, it is Satkai Jariya. So, uh, so this is the importance of smile. So this is about gestures that we have already talked uh, about before. So <clears throat> gestures are something that uh, capture attention. You know, you shake your head and uh, it brings a uh, positive reinforcement to the students. So gestures and the using of gestures in your presentation and teaching that equally collaborates with the content that you're speaking. So that makes the teaching style, presentation style, or the communication style lively. So this is about posture and body orientation. So uh, we talk, we walk when we are in the class. Or when you're presenting, uh, it's uh, not good to stand on the rostrum or dais and state what you are saying. You should be walking and standing erect. But you should not be rigid in standing erect, like you should be moving, you should be uh, facing the audience. And uh, remember one thing, whenever you are uh, presenting something, or even you are acting on stage, uh, do not turn your back to the audience. 
you should never be showing your back to the audience because that loses eye contact and it is not good for teaching uh, or presentations or communication. So you should maintain the proper eye contact. So this should be your posture. And uh, this uh, speaking with your back turned or looking at the floor, ceiling should be avoided. And extra hand movement in your pocket uh, inside or combing your head uh, here with your finger. So that is uh, not good when uh, you're teaching somewhere. There are always cultural norms which dictate a comfortable distance for interaction with the audience. So this proximity has something to do with the distance and uh, the reverence uh, which uh, happens in your communication. You're talking to your boss, you're talking to your teacher, you're listening to a lecture, you're sitting in formal, informal gathering. <clears throat> so proximity at certain levels. Sometimes it happens that within a class we want discipline or whenever you're presenting something in your classes, you want people uh, uh, listen to you. So uh, some people use distractors, they're rocking, they're uh, leg swinging, they're tapping, they're using their pens aimlessly, and uh, they're using uh, uh, the fingers to drum on the chair. They're busy with mobile phone. So to avoid this thing, you should be walking within the class. Uh, and if you're uh, a presenter, you should be walking in this way that everyone is uh, uh, like in front of you and you are having proper eye contact. Your voice is audible to all of them. So this uh, makes them alert and uh, uh, like proximity is increased in this. So now the paralinguistic features, uh, I have already given you uh, some uh, details about it. So here is furthermore, in paralinguistic features we have tone, stress, rhythm, loudness. Uh, in tone we uh, refer to intonation, like the rise and fall of human speech sound. Sometimes we need to lower our voice, our tone, sometimes we bring the tone to the high pitch. So this is uh, the movement of tone. We should not be uh, maintaining one tone, uh, the monotone basically. So that creates, that monotone creates monotonous in the class. So that, 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 that such a presentation, such conversation, such communication, such lecture sounds boring. So we need to bring intonation. We need to bring rise and fall in our, in our tones. Stress is uh, again linked with the tone. We uh, stress in uh, sentences, we stress uh, in the words. So when we are stressing the words, we stress syllables in them. And when we are stressing the sentences, we stress the words in them. For example, uh, in a shorter way, I would like to give you uh, an example. Like uh, normally in English, we stress on the first syllable of a noun and second syllable of a verb. So the word research is a noun. I'm stressing more on the word re, first syllable. Research is a noun and research is verb. So this makes a differentiation between them. Uh, in, in another way, uh, presentations and present. So present and present both are different things. Uh, present is uh, the gift, present is to uh, gift it to someone. So in both. So present and present are the same, uh, 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 like have the same spellings, but they are pronounced differently when uh, dealing them as a noun or as a verb. So in sentence structure or sentence stress, sorry, uh, we can use different kind of sentences uh, and the meanings change due to our stress pattern in them. Like if I say, I ordered you to bring a bouquet of red roses and if I stress on you, so that will be giving a different sense. I ordered you to bring a bouquet. And if I stress on A, I stress you to bring a bouquet. I ordered you to bring a bouquet. I ordered you to bring a bouquet of red roses. I ordered you to bring a bouquet of red roses. So, uh, like intentions are changing with the stress pattern. Rhythm is the way you continue your speech and you end your speech. You should have proper rhythm in that. There should be no extra breaks. There should be no uh, uh, extra silence in that. So in a proper beginning, in a proper rhythm, your presentation, your lecture should go on. Loudness refers to the uh, quantity of audience and your uh, volume of voice. 
like we should be audible to everyone present in front of us so all the audience should be listening to us and we should be audible to them our voice should not be slow enough that they cannot comprehend what we are saying so we have uh, over oh, 630 muscles in our body eye muscles are the busiest muscles in the body since eyes are all the time working when they're not closed when we're not sleeping except for that time we are always using the eyes so those muscles are the busiest muscles of the body scientists estimate that they may move more than 100000 times a day around 1 lakh times we move the muscles of our eyes we are so busy with them so it takes 17 muscles to smile and 43 to frown so we can use only 17 muscles to bring smile on our face we use 43 muscles to frown and show anger on our face so smile every time you see someone and the strongest muscle in your body is your tongue use it effectively we don't have to talk all the time god has given us two ears and one mouth so that we can listen more and speak less and whatever we speak should be comprehensive and should be full of wisdom So it takes the interaction of 72 different muscles to produce human speech. So there are different muscles in the body which when combined produce the human speech. So we should be taking care of are this force consumed. If we are daily consuming or using utilizing this force and creating a human speech then that speech should be good, positive and productive.